Hey, this is Josh McEwen here with episode 11 of Dufferin Spotlight on Business, where we bring your community to you by letting you know what's in the area while highlighting the advantages of shopping local. This week, we are joined by the founder of Fishing Frenzy, Mike Sklod. Through Fishing Frenzy, Mike connects people with nature by fostering the love of fishing with those that need it most. He has established multiple youth fishing leagues across Ontario, including several in our community. In addition to this, Fishing Frenzy enables veterans, children, and others to enjoy a day of fishing out on the lake with Mike, which is made possible through corporate sponsorships. This is a unique and interesting opportunity, especially if you own a business, so be sure to listen. Mike has built an impressive business that's taken him to places such as the CNE and all over the states, all the while pursuing the noble goal of connecting people with nature and raising a young family with his wife. I found out about Fishing Frenzy on Facebook, where I saw some of the amazing work Mike was doing in our community, which stood out to me given all the negativity that we usually see on there. After meeting Mike, Rob and I understood how lucky we were to have him in Dufferin, as he is a great role model and mentor for kids, and that he really does care about fostering love for our environment. We're glad to have met Mike, and even happier that he agreed to be on our show. We cover a lot here, so this discussion will be split up into two parts, with the second episode releasing this Thursday. To find out more details about Fishing Frenzy, check out their Facebook or Instagram, and of course our website, fishingfrenzy.com. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy this this episode of Dufferin Spotlight on Business. Hi, it's Josh McEwen here with Dufferin Spotlight on Business, and as per usual, I'm joined by Rob Bailey. Hey everyone, hope you're doing good today. Today we're lucky enough to have Mike Sklad in from Fishing Frenzy. How are you doing today? I'm doing amazing. Thanks for having me guys. I appreciate this. No problem. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your business to start? Yeah, well I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my family. Super important to me. Priority number one. Um, Yeah, I have a beautiful wife. She's my business partner, my design team, my financial person. She's pretty much everything. Uh, I'm the face of the business. She just puts me kind of out on the stage and then I teach the kids, right? Nice. <laughs> so she's awesome, super supportive of what I do, uh, of what we do, my vision. I mean, we have four kids. They are amazing. There's uh, Kyla, who's eight years old, Caden, who's four years old. And then we have twin girls, Riley and Everly, who are just turned one years old. Awesome. Wow. So lots of energy in our house, running around like crazy. And it keeps me young. And I just love getting in the trenches with them. You know? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, you got your whole own fishing team there. Yep, exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Family support is important. Yep. I mean, even at like some of the shows that we go to, we set out a couple of days before and we got the kids running around, <laughs> you know, trying to make sure they're not getting into everybody else's business and, you know, that kind of stuff. But they're having fun. They're around it. They're learning about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that's so important to me to pass that vision and that knowledge on to my kids and, and doing something important with your life, right? For sure. It's really great. It passes on great values, good work ethic because they see you working away. Like it's good to get that when you're young. And I mean, getting all that family time in too, because I mean, usually when people relate to work, it's time apart from the family. So if you can make it work and have your family there, that's... Absolutely. And I mean, even like my situation, I had a full time job for 15 years and it was actually kind of a blessing in disguise. It wasn't something I loved doing. It was kind of it was an office job okay i'm an outdoors guy it was like soul crushing (laughs) for me okay but at the same time i like to look at things in a positive light so yeah so it's kind of cool that it enabled me to start my business on a part-time basis yeah and really kind of grow it and get to the point where i recently left my full-time job and am going through a transition so right now we were talking about it before the show started is um it's kind of cool and i really appreciate you guys having me on to talk about the business about my life And I'm at the point where I'm in a transition. So it's a key point where we don't know if in two years I'm going to take leaps and bounds and make my business into something that I envision, or am I going to have to take some steps back and kind of get back into the workforce and all that kind of stuff, right? And one of the biggest things why I made that choice was, well, there's two main reasons. One, to spend more time with my family because they're young. This time goes so fast. Everybody keeps telling me. I mean, my oldest daughter's eight. Like, that's crazy to me. Yeah. Uh, But also to show them that if you have a dream, if you have passion in life for something, you should always follow it. Like, make it happen. There's different roadblocks, but do it. Yeah. Because most people think you live once. So, you know what I mean? So, (laughs) but in this lifetime, do something important. Like, it's the most important thing in life is being happy. That's what I think. Exactly. So, I try to do that, and that's where we're heading. <laughs> awesome. Hopefully, that passes down to the kids. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you've alluded that your business is based outdoors. So, can you tell us exactly what your business is about? Yeah, absolutely. So, our company is called Fishing Frenzy. That's friend with a Z-Y. Awesome. And, um, 
kind of play on words me and my wife actually both came up with it like at the exact same time so it's pretty cool right uh, we literally texted each other like this is how it should be spelt crazy story but it was pretty awesome so we started by we created this fishing exhibit that travels to fairs and festivals okay. and so we can introduce kids and families to fishing and teach them about ethical angling by bringing fishing to their front doorstep so to speak for those that don't know what is ethical angling so to everybody, it's something different. To me, it's not always catch and release, but if you want to eat fish, that's fine. It's part of our right. But selective harvesting is a very important part of sustaining our fisheries. Yes. And so ethical angling is, you know, when you go out there, take the garbage that you find. Don't litter, like pick up after other people. Like who cares if it pisses you off or not, yeah. but it's a part of like, being a good steward to our land, right? Help conserve um, what we got. Absolutely. Like ethical angling is really about being conservationists and protecting our wildlife and our fisheries and our water and like the whole big picture, right? Because exactly. everything runs downstream. So really, if I like fishing, how can I help protect our fishery is everything really, exactly. right? Even in our own homes, how we recycle, how we reuse, all that kind of stuff, right? So selective harvesting, for example, I learned this on one of our trips. We went out to the Queen City X in Regina, Saskatchewan, and we got hired to set up our exhibit there. And a young guy came to volunteer with us and he was uh, studying marine biology. So he told me about the difference of if you harvest a four pound bass compared to a two pound bass and when they spawn that two pound bass compared to the four pound bass that four pound bass is twice as big but it does about 10 times the amount of eggs and it's a crazy difference right so yeah. like i grew up and if it was over two pounds and if you wanted to eat it you eat it so i was two pounds three pounds four pounds even some of the really big ones five pound bass we were harvesting them but what we were doing was taking away that next generation of fish yes right and to regenerate that lake right and so that was one thing that really popped into my mind of okay i gotta change my way of thinking around being a conservationist and if i want to keep a fish right so yeah. just something as little as that helped me grow and i mean i'm always growing i'm always learning from my mentors and also the kids because we can always learn lessons from everybody around us right exactly. so yeah. so that was kind of selective harvesting as part of it ethical angling is just being a good steward to our land being a good person to other anglers to other boaters there's so many different elements that we have to be aware of and conscious about and you know what, there's people on the other side of the spectrum who think fishing is really bad and it hurts the fish and all that kind of stuff, right? So as a ethical angler, I don't want to get into arguments about it, but at the same time, I want to respect other people's opinions. And I had some really good conversations yeah. with people who thought we were doing something horrible and bad, but when I explain what we're doing and they tell me their side, like we have really good conversations, right? Exactly. So like, yeah, ethical angling is about just a kind of a lifestyle of respecting our environment and that's really what we want to teach kids as a company and families who are new to the outdoors or angling or to our country or whatever, right? Is we want to teach them about being respectful to our environment and our natural world and really want to protect it because kids are the future. It's so simple, but really they are the next CEOs, the next politicians, the next leaders of our world. They're also the next teachers. So if we can influence them and mentor them to think kind of like along those same wavelengths of respecting our environment, then they're going to want to protect it when they're in those positions to make something really change, right? Exactly. Because like me personally, I'm not one who likes confrontation. <laughs> I'm not about to go try to change our politicians' minds today and the decision makers of big companies. I, that's not me. Yeah. I don't have that kind of fight in me. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I, I do strongly believe and I'm very passionate about making changes because, you know, us as a species, we're the most destructive thing on this earth. Yep. You know, but we're also very loving and we're also very smart and we are evolving in a lot of good ways and also in a lot of bad ways, right? So, you know, I want to just try to spread my light and share with others, especially kids and families, kind of my views and my vision and through a fun activity of fishing. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as that, you know? And like you said, humans are often portrayed as the most destructive, but they also have the capability to be the most beneficial to the planet as well. It's just a matter of what they want to do. And I mean, it's easier to be destructive. <laughs> Absolutely. And that kind of comes down to even like what I was doing with my job. I was settling. And you know what? Like we get settled in our ways. And we don't want to change. Exactly. But you know what? Every day we're changing. We're growing. We're never who we were yesterday. So take that opportunity to evolve in a positive way. You know what I mean? Like yeah. so much hate going on around the world. We complain about it, but then we spread it too it's weird right to me a lot of things kind of don't make sense uh, a lot of double standards but 
Exactly. You know, I'm just going to keep trying to do my thing and look forward. But I, I think it's great that we have someone like you running this because I'm teaching kids how to fish, I mean, it's good to have a positive role model at the top there. So when they're learning from someone, they're learning some of the right things. I know you said everyone has different views on what ethical angling is, but I think everyone could agree roughly with what you said and conservation and making sure that it's there for the next generations is the most important thing, right? So with that, I got to ask too, uh, what's your favorite kind of fishing? and species that you like to go for i like this question (laughs) (laughs) uh so a little background i grew up in mississauga as a city boy but i'm very fortunate to have my dad who was an angler bring us up to the cottage almost every summer and our cottage is northeast in barry's bay so southeast side of algonquin park and we had all these little ponds and little lakes that we can go fishing and we fished out of a canoe my dad would throw the canoe in the back of his pickup truck and we would go to different lake and we would fish for bass largemouth bass specifically in the shallow swampy waters with lily pads fallen logs and so what i got accustomed to and what I love fishing for is those largemouth bass using specific baits, right? A lot of the baits that I use are weedless. Some of them float on top of the water like a mouse or a frog and they're fake. I don't use live bait (laughs) much at all. And I would just use those through the lily pads, through that like thick, I call it the jungle. (laughs) And you'd get these largemouth bass. Sometimes they're, you know, pounds. Sometimes they're a lot bigger, like four or five pounds jumping out of the water and striking your lure. And it's like, that is the absolute most exciting exciting part is when you get that bite right so like that's what i grew up fishing that's my specialty is the shallow swampy water weedless fishing usually out of a canoe and so i stuck to that and even at my older age like when i have free time for myself which i rarely have free time if i'm gonna go fishing i want to do that yeah is shallow water bassin you know, top water, love it. Those explosions on top of what just gets me so excited, (laughs) right? But at my older age, I'm starting to learn more about other ways to fish. And even like as a teacher and a mentor, I can really teach the kids about the way I learned because that's my fishing experience. Yeah. Every angler has different experience, different knowledge because of their life growing up, their only experience. They learn different techniques, different tactics to catch those fish. And sometimes, I mean, all the time, different species, they bite differently. They're live in different parts of the lake so targeting a lake trout compared to a largemouth bass is like polar opposite lake trout are at like 200 feet 100 feet 80 feet wherever they are but they're like deep water fish so the bass they kind of go deeper in the winter you know they migrate kind of up and down the water column but they're staying in those spots where they can get to the shallows to feed or they hang out in the shallows right so yeah it's kind of cool to learn different stuff but i'm so passionate about that one specific type <laughs> like very very specific way of fishing But that's the one of the things with teaching about fishing is I want to open up people's eyes because through my years of teaching fishing, I've had so many parents and kids come up to me and say, oh, we don't really like fishing or this and that. I'm like, well, when you fished, you tried fishing. What did you do? Like, well, we sat there with a bobber and a worm off the dock and we waited for the fish to come. I go, you know what? That's one style of fishing. To me, that's boring too. Okay, it really is. I mean, unless those sunfish or perch are biting one after the other, that could be fun, especially for kids. That's a great way to start. Yeah. But there's like 20 different ways you can fish a river. Oh, yeah. There's another like 50 ways you can fish a lake, whether you're using different rods, reels, bait, where you're fishing it off the shoreline, whether you're wading in the water, whether you're using a boat, trolling, like there is so many different ways. So even for me, I haven't tried half of them, (laughs) but you know, there's so many people out there who are anglers who have way more knowledge than me, but that's not why, you know, fishing frenzy is where it is and why we're one of the leaders of teaching kids in the industry is because I'm putting myself out there and I'm sacrificing my own fishing time. Like I don't do fishing tournaments. I've done a couple, but I don't do them because I'd rather focus on teaching kids and families and inspiring them to be good people and care for our environment, whether they like fishing or not. And this is another thing, right? It's about fishing to me, but it's it's not because I want the kids to grow up to be outdoors, be active. When you're out in nature, that is like the one of the biggest things that is helpful to us as humans, especially kids, because it's good for your physical health yeah. and your mental health and your spiritual health too. Like it 100%. is it is huge. It's natural therapy. Yes. And that's kind of been like pushed off the side. There wasn't really too much science involved in it, but now there's so many studies that prove that like nature is the thing that we need. It's not fishing. And this fishing is just something that you do to get out there. It's just an activity we use to yes. be out in outdoors, right? Yeah. So that's kind of like my mentality is I want kids in nature, you know, whether they like fishing or not, they could pick up canoeing or bird watching or whatever. Exactly. Like, 
that's my goal. Just getting them out there. And I think that's another big thing about what you're doing too. Because like yourself, I was lucky enough to have a couple role models in my life to take me out fishing. But then there's a lot of people, I know we were talking the other day, that haven't had the opportunity to get taken out to even see if they like or enjoy the sport, yes. right? And and then like you said too, just to get out there, maybe they care, don't care so much for the fishing, but they're going around the kayak or a canoe or whatever they get the chance to do. And oh, well, I like this. Maybe I'll keep doing this, right? Yep, absolutely. And I mean, to touch on that too, is we noticed that a lot of kids who came to our exhibit at the fairs and festivals, like one of the biggest events we did was the Canadian National Exhibition, the C&E in awesome. Toronto, That's so the, the X, right? <laughs> and so we did that for like seven years and our exhibit was about 4,000 square feet and we had roughly 80 to 100,000 people come through our exhibit in the agriculture building. So tons and tons of people. And to your point, a lot of the families who were casting at our dock would say, I've never casted before. And I talked to the parents. Well, did you guys fish when you were younger? And the mom might say, yeah, I did. My dad took me out or my grandpa took me out when I was younger. Yeah. But that was it. When I was young, I remember fishing. And so we actually like realized what people were saying and found that lots of people just don't go fishing, whether they're from a new country or if they just don't have someone in their family. So it's something where it's passed down just generation to generation, angling, hunting, that kind of stuff. There's not many places where you can sign your kid up or they can go somewhere in our communities to yeah. learn about fishing. There's some one day events that are great all around Ontario, yeah. but usually they're like kids fishing derby. They're fun. They get people involved. You could even walk home with a rod and reel and stuff like that and take it home. But one of the big things we noticed too is then it was up to the parents to take the kids fishing. And if those are the same parents who don't take their kids fishing because they don't know how to fish, Fishing is scary to parents for three reasons. There's water. Yeah. So the fear of your kid drowning. Yep. There's sharp hooks yeah. and there's fish with teeth and sharp spines and stuff. So like yeah. as a parent who doesn't know how to fish and isn't comfortable or confident going fishing, that's scary all on its own, right? So like why yeah. are they going to try something like that, right? So we wanted to create something where parents can sign their kids up or even with the exhibit was we're teaching them to cast with just little plugs there's no hooks on it so it looks literally like one of those goldfish that you eat but yeah. it's hard plastic and there's no hooks on it so we're casting at targets so they get to use the fishing rods the different type that we have at our exhibit and they get to use these different types of fishing rods to see like how to use them because that's the first step in fishing is how to learn how to cast so if they're casting in an environment where we eliminated those dangers then okay that's one one step then the parent seal she's really good at it right yeah. and we noticed that a lot a lot of kids who come and have never cast before some of them it's like oh my gosh okay that's a natural caster like they just get it <laughs> you know others need a little bit more teaching a little bit more time on the docks to really kind of understand the mechanics of a spinning reel or even a push button reel yeah but it's kind of neat to see that hear from the parents why they don't fish yeah right and, and kind of make it an environment where it's positive for them to learn in right so yeah that was kind of one of the things and then kind of to add to that is we wanted to create a program where parents can sign their kids up to it yeah and so i'm going to jump right into that is uh sure. is our youth fishing league so yeah. we'd actually started the idea was born right here in orangeville <laughs> at island lake so we talked to credit valley conservation area they're amazing people over there by the way and they do such an amazing job over there protecting our land and that amazing ecosystem that they have there right so it's a great fishery there's cool birds and all that kind of stuff to see so we want approach them because it's our home community i want it to be more part of my own community and having that full-time job didn't allow me to do that i was commuting i was nine to five away from the kids life sucked <laughs> you know what i mean like i was paying my bills but life wasn't making sense to me so yes having this youth fishing league here in my own home community i was able to start connecting with people and especially with the people who kind of saw the same way i see with getting kids outdoors and so credit valley conservation allowed us to have our youth fishing league at island lake so our very first one was at island lake and then we did one at ken willens for our first year and that was kind of like our trial run we did two leagues one in june one in july and it was awesome we got great feedback the kids and families who sign up to our league really loved the adventures that we went on yeah and learning about fishing and so I'll break down what our youth fishing league is yeah, since please. I'm talking about it yeah please do <laughs> um so basically 
we wanted to create a youth fishing league as an alternative to sign their kids up to their sports leagues, dance classes that you see in like every community all over the province, right? So my goal is to get it to that point where it's pretty common in communities all over. Yeah. But the idea is that parents can sign their kids up. They come out whatever day it is, but it's once a week for two hours for four weeks. And so each week we teach them something new. We take them out fishing, shoreline fishing. So it's all about that adventure, walking along the path to our fishing spot. Take some cast, teach them about like trying to catch sunfish or bass or pike or whatever they want to learn, right? Each week is kind of a different lesson. But along those walks were really special moments where we encourage the kids to embrace their inner squirrel like <laughs> mentality, right? Where they see a squirrel and they, oh, they get distracted easily. We're kind of all like that. I mean, I'm, I'm like that a lot, actually. But... <laughs> It's funny because we want to embrace that and being in nature, you really can. You can follow that frog jumping to the butterfly, to the beaver in the water as you're fishing or going to the next fishing spot. And I think that's one thing that we really lose from teaching our kids is when we put them in the school and they're being taught in school, they're told to stay focused most of the time, right? At home, focus and stay focused. And anytime they kind of get distracted, we're guiding them back to their paper or their homework or reading or whatever they're doing. Yeah. Where when they're outdoors, I really encourage that because I think it's so important to let their minds wander with nature. Yeah. And well, like, you never know what you're going to see. Out absolutely. There either, right. right? You, yeah. You, you, absolutely. you pay too much attention to one thing and you could be missing something amazing going on. So. Yep. I like, I mean, some of my favorite fish stories actually have nothing to do with fish. <laughs> that sound indicates a commercial break. We're new. So we'll just take this time to let you know what Dufferin Spotlight actually does. Each week we will be releasing a new episode of our show, Dufferin Spotlight on Business, which will feature a discussion with business leaders from around Dufferin County regarding their businesses and accomplishments. The achievements of small business leaders largely go unnoticed, but it is our goal to highlight and recognize them as these are the people who keep small communities like ours alive. In addition to bringing more attention to the businesses in Dufferin, we will share the advantages of shopping local. So be sure to check back each week to see the amazing things people are doing through their businesses. To find out more about what we do, and to stay updated on the other shows we will be producing, be sure to check us out at DufferinSpotlight.ca. The Youth Fishing League, we really embrace that adventure. Yeah. And we encourage the parents to either volunteer to become coaches. If they know anything about fishing, we encourage them to volunteer to be uh, assistant coaches to go with our teams out fishing or also like safety monitors so they, they can yeah. watch the groups, make sure everybody's being safe and having fun. But we also really encourage them to be part of that group that we go fishing with because we want them to learn. Yeah, We want to give them some lessons so that when their child is done with our youth fishing league, they could come back. But I want them to take up their own time and be like, you know what, we're going to go fishing. And over the last two years, I've had quite a few parents buy their fishing license and start going out with their son or daughter to go fishing and create their own memories out on the water and use the knowledge that they learn at Fishing Frenzy to try to catch fish. And I've had personal text messages being like, yeah, we just caught this one yeah. when we were up north on, uh, on vacation. That's and, um, and that makes me so happy. Like, yeah. I love it. Love I mean, it. It's amazing. You're giving the parents the tools to then be able to take their kids out even on their own and keep that going. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Which, like, we're creating new anglers yeah. right so even for like the fishing industry as a whole in canada or even ontario it's very tight-knit there's a lot of money spent like if you look at the breakdown like there's billions of dollars spent by anglers and even hunters for traveling tourism lures all the gear oh, yeah. tons but the amount of people in the fishing industry selling and stuff like that i kind of compared it last time we met to the way our high school football yeah. how big it is compared to the united states high school football yeah. and like like the difference of fishing is very similar from fishing in Canada to fishing in the United States on like a competitive level. And in the States, they have high school teams like they're growing so big, so big here. We don't have as much of that kind of opportunity for the youngsters. And I look at my programs as like the minor league systems, <laughs> right? Yep. And like even up to high school, we have a kind of a program for them anyway, where they can volunteer and become mentors and we can help them grow some skills and then create them into jobs right so it's yeah. like a whole flow to it right yeah. so like it's a funneling system where we can help mentor them into mentors and then create jobs for them too right yeah but it's pretty neat to you know just see the kids growing up and then they want to volunteer and then you see them in action teaching a young child when they're only a teenager and it's like okay that 
that's so rewarding. Yeah. Well, and yeah. knowing that you had a part in that too, right? You, because I mean, at the end of the day, like that'd be a big thing in itself. Knowing that you passed on a tradition of its own, where now you have someone else that you taught that loves to teach other people, right? Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we sign up seven year old to thirteen year old. That's what our league was in the past. I mean, we're gonna break it up to different age groups yeah. so that we give more people opportunities. Even having like a all girls league, something that we always wanted to do and give them kind of like a more comfortable setting yeah. for them to learn and grow into fishing. And fishing has always kind of been a male dominated sport and activity, but we want to kind of open that up a little bit more as well. So when they sign up, they get a fishing rod, reel, tackle, a fishing frenzy jersey with their name on it. They get <laughs> polarized glasses, a hat. We want to give them a great starter package yeah. to get going on their fishing adventures. Some people come in and some of the kids are like, I got three rods at home. I'm like, awesome. You got tackle, you got rods. We're still going to give you our package, right? But bring those two. We encourage you. If you got a bait casting fishing rod, bring it because when I go fishing, I bring a couple rods. Like if they can do that, if they have that stuff already, if they are already that passionate about fishing, joining our leagues, we want them to bring it because they can utilize that, right? Yeah. It's like anybody, right? The hockey players, how many sticks do they have? So with different rods, you have different options. That's kind of how I fish anyway, right? Yeah. But each week is a different lesson. We keep score, but the main score is really the last week of our youth fishing leagues is our championship day. Okay, so this is where kind of we wanted to incorporate competition into our league because the fishing industry, there is a big sport. Yeah. There's fishing tournaments. They're huge in the States. They're they're pretty big here too. Like I have a lot of friends who are into the fishing tournaments. And I mean, that's why there's so much technology in the rods and reels and stuff. It's not for the recreational angler. It's for the tournaments. Yeah. The tournament guys and girls, right? Um, So we wanted to add that, right? Yeah, I'm sure, sure. it gets the kids going too, right? Knowing that yeah, there's, I know, mean, there's like, a little yeah, competition they, going. On absolutely and, and we want to make it friendly competition right like yeah. so you, there is a goal to be the champion or the, if it's one of our leagues is a team setting then we want one team to come out on top right yeah their names get engraved on the championship trophy right nice and we are one of those companies where we give everybody a trophy okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know what it, it's it makes kids so happy but we also have that if you are the champion you get something extra right yeah so we give them a little prize pack and their name on the big trophy right so when we're at shows we showcase our program we have the big championship trophy with someone's name on there that just won it right and then if they come if we're in hamilton or london and one of the leagues from there they can come and see their name and point to and they're proud of that right so yeah our youth league incorporates that competition and we want to basically show them a path from introducing them from our traveling exhibits to signing them up at our youth fishing league and then filtering them and kind of guiding them into those programs where they can now kind of create a career out of it and get into the tournament circuit so there's two main competitive fishing organizations here in Ontario. There's the CBAF and they have like a high school program. Okay. Kind of where you could, it's not in high schools, but high school students can sign up to their club and join some of their tournaments. Like, I don't know fully all about that kind of stuff. One of my friends, Daniel, he really knows and takes care of that kind of stuff with one of the CBAF clubs. And there's another one, which is the Bass Federation. So okay. B-A-S-S. And there's Mississauga chapter. There's Kitchener Cambridge Waterloo there's like 30 different ones for both sides that are competitive fishing it's tournaments and that tournament gets people going you know what I mean like it's exciting you get you blast off in the, these big bass boats so even for high school students if you join these clubs when you go out fishing with them you have to sign up to the tournament date if there's 10 boaters that have signed up to that specific tournament then 10 high schoolers can go I think they do 10 or they might do 20 like two high schoolers per boater but basically if you don't have to have a boat to be in these Okay, good. So it's, it is a really good way to learn your way around a fishing boat. Like I did it when, not as a high schooler, but I did it in my mid twenties where I joined clubs and I could become a non-boater. Yeah. So same kind of concept, but I know with the high schoolers, they dedicate specific tournaments, two or three or however many they do during the season, specifically for the high schoolers, right? So they get that opportunity to get out on the boat and compete and catch some bass, put them in their live well, weigh them in and see who wins. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> well, I mean yeah. It's a great experience for for anyone who might not have that opportunity at home too, right? Like you don't have anyone in your family or friends that has a boat. That's something you could sign up for and yeah. definitely see if you like it or not. I mean, I think most people would love that opportunity, but you can know for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, it's Josh with another commercial break. Still no real ads, but I just thought I'd let you know that I don't know my passwords. <laughs> 
That stops me from writing them down, sharing them, or worst of all, reusing the same password for my banking, email, and the, on that weird website that I'll never return to that will most likely be breached next month. This keeps me secure while making my life more convenient. To figure out how you can do the same, be sure to check out the articles on our website, dufferinspotlight.ca. Now back to the show, Dufferin Spotlight on Business. <laughs> so I know you said you have your exhibits and then you got your children's fishing league. What would you say your most popular product and service is? Well, our youth league is, this is a, the second year that we ran it. So the first year we had two leagues. Yeah. The second year that we ran it, we actually had six leagues and we expanded it out to Midland where we had a league operator running that league for us. So we trained her. She was one of our ambassadors who came out to the CE year after year with her family to help teach. So shout out to Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're awesome. So she ran that league for us and the way we kind of mentored her and got her trained was basically like she's in midland she is the best person to run that league in midland because she knows the community best yeah that's where she lives that's where all her connections are and she made some great connections there and just was an amazing ambassador for what we are doing and what she believes in about getting kids into fishing as well so we had the league there we had a hamilton league that we ran at valens conservation area so we had clint run that league what up, Clint? <laughs> and then I ran the other four. So we expanded and we did two at Island Lake and two at Ken Willens in Caledon. And so it was it was fun. It was awesome. Some of the leagues, we kind of experimented with the league dates too. So it wasn't all on the weekend. We did a couple Sundays here for this league. And then one league was all on Wednesday evening. So after school kind of thing, just to kind of test it out, see what parents want. Like, I mean, I'm a yeah. parent. I kind of know what we want for our lifestyle, but every parent's different, right? There's programs that run every day of the week on the weekend all that kind of stuff so yeah fishing is a little different because the conservation areas one they close before dark yeah so we can't be running it and it's not safe to really fish at night with kids i mean yeah. i like night fishing personally but that's my own kind of thing too right yeah so we wanted to kind of experiment with that we found a lot of success with the wednesday night league from six to eight in july i think summer a lot of people want to go to the cottage get away on the weekends so we didn't have a lot of people sign up for our weekend league yeah like, i think we had four or six but then our Wednesday night league we had like six was a pretty good number like we will actually want to kind of cap it we don't want too many kids in our league yeah you want to um, keep it personal even though we want to expand and give more people that opportunity we yeah we want to make it personal but we want to make sure that we're giving every child that quality of education yeah. that we really believe in and that one-on-one -on -one time and like I want to make it personal like I love meeting these kids and, and getting to know them and we actually had quite a few kids come into our leagues who had autism and I not very familiar with it yeah you know in that kind of sense of being like a hands-on but i got to meet some amazing kids Great. and really connected with a few of them through our leagues and really just noticed how much of that natural therapy helped kids with autism and it's stuff that i've read for the last couple of years about getting in touch with nature and connecting and great book by the way is last child in the woods uh oh, yeah, richard yes. louvre yes amazing book and then the other one that i'm studying is coyote's guide to mentoring in nature and it's a phenomenal phenomenal book all about the leaders and the mentors yeah. so it's not so much about the kids the last child in woods is all about the kids and kind of like how our society is is evolving with technology but we're getting disconnected with nature and it's affecting us on so many different levels and just simple studies of having kids go out into nature one hour every day for a week even has improved their focus in the classroom right after that and it's like crazy to see that but they're doing studies and so like that knowledge that i've received by picking up books and reading has allowed me to kind of see this in a different light and a different way and not make it about fishing but more about connecting with nature so connecting with these kids with autism was very humbling and very um i don't know i got emotional about it too right like because you're helping they can do anything they want so it kind of even brings me to a special person that we took out fishing as a part of another program that we ran and so we run this program called the safe program okay so we teamed up with advanced marine lake bellwood so they sell boats and they are an amazing company so they heard about us what we do with families and kids and they gave us a promo boat for the season wow and so we came up with a program called the safe program it's sponsor a fishing experience and what we wanted to do with the boat is get more people fishing but we wanted to use it as kind of like a guide service except we don't want you guys to pay me and i'll take you out 
fishing. Yeah. We wanted to get companies to sponsor a day of fishing and we would take out vets and underprivileged kids and people with disabilities. That's and so awesome. we were able to take out this year, we took out seven different trips through this program. And one of the people was an amazing person. She has autism. She's been to our exhibit helping us. I think she's about 25, 27. And she's super awesome. She loves fishing. And we wanted to take her out to tell her story. And so through this program was a big part of telling their story, documenting it. The companies who are sponsoring the day of fishing get the social media marketing. So we would post videos, photos, tell the story of our day on the water, yeah. but also focus on the person we take out so they can tell their story, right? Yes. So we took out some vets. We took some young kids and then this young adult who has autism who just wanted to spread her positive message about them being able to do anything in life and it was super awesome uh, I, I mean I think yeah, that it was awesome comes back Amazing. to what we said before too it's for everyone I mean it's getting that opportunity to get out there to get to do something you love and for some people whether they know if they like it yet or not I mean but just to be able to get out there and that's amazing okay, yeah you're giving them absolutely. that platform even just to go like one of our favorite pro programs are our most popular programs that has really kind of risen to the top because yeah. it's the feel good story. So when we took out Kelsey, she's the one with autism who we took out. And when we took out her, when we told that story on social media, Facebook and Instagram, and people listened to the story and watched our videos and saw the fish that we were catching, but the time that we were being outdoors and focusing on nature and, and each other and spending that time together is such an important part of why we fish. Yes. Like the bond I have with my dad is because he took me out fishing you know what i mean and my uncle yeah. too he was a big mentor for me so sharing those stories of these people who we took out part of our safe program really was a light that was shining and really like help people like i got so many messages about what we're doing and how amazing it was and it was funny because the way this program started was we got connected with two people in particular from advanced marine and they really loved what we were doing and they gave me that opportunity and i brought my son my four-year-old son to every Every meeting we went to because he, he just started junior kindergarten but this meetings were happening last season so before school started and their whole staff was like giving them high fives every time we went in and like he was hanging out at like one of the guys desk for like half hour just talking taking some of his snacks like you know, and, but it was just amazing atmosphere yeah. To like and just felt right to me that like these people really care and they want to do something good they love families they actually have an amazing little spot where kids can watch tv do crafts play with toys while they talk to the parents about boats and getting into boating and you know sales obviously but also about like how to boat properly and like yeah. they're really they're not pushy salesmen like you would find at like a used car dealership yeah. right most of them anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so they gave me such a great opportunity and so literally after my my first meeting with them seeing the potential to get a, a bass boat and what I can do with it I didn't want to just bring it to shows and show it off and kind of promote for them that way I wanted to do something more and so literally when I was driving home from Fergus area to Orangeville half hour drive or whatever with my son he probably passed out in the back <laughs> I came up with that idea of the safe program and how we can get businesses to sponsor us to take someone out fishing and document it that's amazing really simple but it was amazing for me to get out on the water yeah a place I love but take someone else with me take someone else on that journey with me and kind of mentor them for that four hours that we're on the water and like a couple of them caught their very first fish so it's amazing well, so amazing i mean seriously man like like you said like a lot of people would just take that boat go to shows and it's like oh yeah look at this boat i was given a eh? look at that or i'm gonna go in the lake look at this i'm on social media i'm, I'm an instagram inf influencer <laughs> or some bs like that but here you are doing some real good in the community in doing what you love of course but you're also doing that and you're helping get their story out there you're helping the company and you're helping these kids and and the vets as well and, and everyone like it's it's amazing yeah thank you i appreciate that man i i also saw it as an opportunity like i went to the royal canadian legion here in orangeville and connected with them yeah and basically they kind of looked at me like wait you want to give us a free fishing trip like <laughs> what's the catch like what's going on so i went in and i talked to their board members and told them about what the program was all about and giving them some time on the water would be something very important you know yeah. like there's so many people go through struggles in life and like we wanted to kind of give back to people who would need that right 
right? And that was one of the places we went. We went to Dufferin County, Big Brothers and Sisters, and we approached them to take out some of their kids as well, right? With their big brother or sisters. So we had some amazing stories. And then some of the people we took out was one of my buddies who I met first year at the CNE. This young boy, 12 years old in a wheelchair, posts up at our live fish pond and starts fishing. And so I sit beside him and I start talking to him and he looks over at me and he doesn't say anything. He starts using his hands, like not real sign language, but like the generalized kind of stuff, like yeah. waving his hand in front of his nose as like it stinks, right? Like yeah. That kind of sign language. So he couldn't talk and he was never supposed to walk, okay? Because he has spina bifida. Okay. And so I met this young man, Mason. He was 12 at the time. And we became like really good friends. I literally sat there beside him. And at the first year of the CNA, I just want to set the picture for everybody. I literally had my mom, my dad, my sister, my uncle, my aunt, my cousin, my friends, all <laughs> helping me run the show. It was nobody in the fishing industry. Like nobody knew about what I was doing. It was yeah. all family and friends. Like it was raw grassroots kind of stuff, right? <laughs> and so I'm here, I'm at this big show, a really important show. And this young boy sits and, and, and starts fishing with me. And I literally sat there with him for like two hours straight fishing <laughs> and like we run the line every five minutes you got to switch it over but like i just wanted to fish with this kid like i felt it was so important and next day he comes with his own worms <laughs> and he sits <laughs> and we fish for another two hours and i got to know him over the years he came to so many different shows and just his family got to know them very personally and like it was just amazing meeting that young man and he became one of my best friends like he's such an amazing inspiration for me yeah because even though he can't talk he'll grunt and you can understand what he's saying like me and him would communicate so well. I just understood what he was trying to say. And so he was the very first person to come out on our boat as part of the SAFE program sponsored by the company who gave us the boat. They said, what a better fit is Mason coming out on the boat with us for the very first trip yeah. of this program. That's just like a great program where next year they're going to give us another boat and we're going to do this program again and we're going to try to do 20 or 30 trips. Man, that's awesome. amazing. You know, so yeah, we got out Mason and one of his hands, he can't really hold the fishing rod so there's a lot of help he needs but he loves fishing as much as i do and that's saying a lot because i love fishing <laughs> awesome even going back to the vets too i mean for some people i mean they could be have such a hard time and that one day could be so special to someone or make that much of a difference on their outlook on life for this point right like oh yeah Big yeah that's yeah. awesome that's even amazing. just even just reintroducing fishing like one of the guys max took him out fishing he was 80 years old and he was a really good angler like we caught a lot of fish we had a great time and he was a talker just like me so we had some like great <laughs> conversations you know and like the whole time we're talking right that's funny because when i go fishing with my dad my dad's always like you talk a lot <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> <laughs> like the, the, the whole uh, perception of you have to be quiet to fish you don't have to i mean you could spook fish with noise for sure but no it's a great way to talk you're stuck in a boat with someone for four hours or six hours or 12 hours like i like to fish sometimes yeah is you're stuck out with them why not talk and like exactly. it's it's almost like I'm a type of person. I'm a guy that's very confident in myself now. I'm my ripe old age of 37. And I'm confident with myself enough now that I can express myself, my emotions, and like, you know, the, the typical stuff you're not supposed to talk to about with other guys, yeah. you know? So like, it's funny. I like expressing myself and getting people to talk about when you're in the boat with someone. Yeah. You know, I have some crazy conversations with people because <laughs> I open up to people and I want people to open up to me. I think it's very important for our mental health to talk to to people yep. right like 100%. and that's a big part of it like and just kind of off topic but quickly highlight this is like we live in a society where we're so quick to call people snowflakes or soft yet we encourage men to speak up and express their emotions that's a double standard like how am i supposed to express my emotions when i know my peers are going to call me names and put me down yeah i don't get that i don't think it's right and like i'm sensitive person yeah but you put me on the rink and throw a puck in the corner you'll see how tough i am you know what I mean? and i'm a little dude right <laughs> but i'm tough in that way right Right, you know, so I don't know. Not to toot my horn, like I, I can't hit anybody, but I, I, I'm tough. I'm on the puck. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, it's Josh again with another commercial break. On top of that, knowing my passwords, I also don't pay for antivirus programs like Norton, Kapersky, or McAfee. Despite this, I feel safer than if I did have them. To see why, check out the articles on our website, DufferinSpotlight.ca. Now back to our show, Dufferin Spotlight on Business. So what do you think makes you different from the competition? Well, I think the biggest thing is that there's not much competition because we've really created our own niche market. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, there is 
indirect competition with your sports leagues and other community programs where parents can sign their kids up to. Yeah. Specifically with our youth fishing league, but like all our programs, they're pretty unique. There's other people who have live fish ponds out there that travel to different events and stuff. But ultimately what we're doing is something very unique and creating that opportunity for families and kids to learn about fishing where there's not really anywhere that they can sign up, right? So it's something where like I have this vision and just stuff comes to me. And like even the youth league, like it was at one point we had this idea of a youth fishing league. It was kind of rough. The dots weren't connected. And then all of a sudden it just woke up in the middle of the night and started writing things down the next morning i told my wife i'm like okay we're doing the youth fishing league this year <laughs> she's like i thought you wanted to push that i'm like no i connected some dots hear me out and uh, and we kind of went through it and she's like okay that makes a lot more sense than like what you had envisioned before right so it was just one of those things and the first year like i said we wanted to just do like a trial run right yeah so i mean competition to us like people like stealing an idea and like using that kind of stuff i mean it's tough on me because i like i said before i'm sensitive so yeah. stuff kind of hurts and i take everything like personally but at the same time is like you know what I got to focus on my path my journey and what I'm supposed to be here for and my vision of what I have in mind is something that I got to just keep focused on and keep doing things in a positive way you know instead of pushing other people down whether they're doing something bad sometimes you got to stand up for yourself yep. but ultimately I'm just going to keep doing things in a positive way instead of being reactionary and in a negative way I want to do something positive and creative you know and inspiring and kind of take the higher road because i don't know that's kind of how i've always been so in business i want to stick to my own ethic they can copy your idea all day long but i mean they can't copy your passion i mean that's definitely something <laughs> evident that you have over that thanks i appreciate that <laughs> anyone can yeah, thank you take people's money and have kids out there fishing but like josh said i don't think many people are going to be able to compete with the passion you have for it to teach so thank you, love thank what you're you. doing yeah. again 100%, 100%. And I mean, still with that too, like you said, there's a lot of indirect competition, but even with that, I mean, I don't see too many things that, like you say, you're bringing kids out to nature, you're getting them away from screens. I mean, there's hockey, there's sports and all that, but still a lot of time you're trapped in a gym or a rink where you're having them out at a lake. Well, and here's the thing too, is like, I grew up playing hockey in the winter and then in the summer I would go to the cottage and fish. Like that was my life, hockey, fishing. I loved hockey, I played some pretty good hockey in Mississauga in the GTA area growing up and like that was my life as a kid i thought i was going to be the next nhl star but i'm a little dude like first in line in every class you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't really help me get to where i wanted to with my hockey career but i had fun doing it. i played for years and, and like you know it was fun and i learned so many valuable lessons from hockey and being in that rink being yep. that rink rat right what i see now too is i had a whole nother life at the cottage that was just so different and like we would snorkel we would ride our bikes we We'd be at the beach swimming, catching frogs and little crayfish and like being in nature and going on hikes and fishing. Yeah. A lot of fishing. And I came to a point in my life, even kind of how this business all started was I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like just kind of like, oh, you got to do those soul searching every once in a while and figure yep. out what you, you're supposed to be doing in this life. And the one thing I asked myself was what did I love doing when I was a kid? And two things came to mind, playing hockey yeah. and fishing. And I kind of looked at hockey is like okay i'm mid to late 20s at this time and i was like okay i can't really do anything with hockey because it's such a saturated market not going to make it anywhere if i wanted to do a hockey school like i didn't play anywhere special to be like that draw people in you know what i mean yeah. so it was like okay what about fishing and that kind of like opened my eyes it was like wait nobody's really doing much with fishing with kids and yeah. then kind of simultaneously i realized how good i was with kids because i'm a big kid myself so <laughs> a lot of kids just liked listening to me and like hanging out and fishing with me and it started kind of evolving from there to the exhibit and just talking to parents and talking to people and kids and it kind of like made me realize is uh you know i i get stage fright i get all that stuff but i realized that i had a really important message to pass on yeah. and that kids needed to kind of hear my message and kind of feel that energy pass on to them and that mentorship and kind of influence them in a positive way you know and just seeing that like nobody's focusing on the kids fishing at that kind of level where it's a continuous thing where they can really be guided to becoming conservation officers or the next tournament anglers or the salesmen in the fishing industry. so there's so many different jobs that we try to really showcase and 
help, especially the teenagers that come volunteer with us. Yeah. So we, at our youth league, at our exhibit, we encourage teenagers to come, high schoolers especially, to get their volunteer hours with us and help out and mentor and we can help grow them. And some of those teens have become young adults and continue to come and help us. And when we have jobs available, we want those people who have been with us. Wow. We've kind of trained them in a way and we see what they do. Like some people are just amazing with mentoring kids. They're just really good at it. It comes natural to them. Some yeah. people train hard and get that knowledge that's out there and use that right and some just aren't good with kids you know what i mean so (laughs) so yeah even when we are hiring people for events or our youth fishing league operators we look for people who are good people number one people who have that passion for the outdoors and that passion for conservation and then who are always just filled with love and don't want to pass that on to like the next generation of like anglers and young kids who are going to grow up to become those next politicians and ceos and leaders right yeah is like pass that positive vibe on right it's a ripple effect we're really planting seeds and from planting seeds what we've done with our company is we've really looked at how it can grow how those planted seeds can grow and evolve and help us mentor others and grow as a company right 100%. I know we touched on it earlier, but would you like to mention any family or friends that might have helped you around the way? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. One big mentor of mine comes to mind, and he's my dad's best friend. Uh, My uncle George, call him uncle. My dad and him grew up since they were six or eight best buddies. And so my uncle had a cottage on Dam Lake up in Barry's Bay. And my dad ended up buying a place there when I was maybe like eight, I think. But we were going up there since I was born. Those two together, when they were teens, got into fishing. And they grew up near Grenadier Pond in the Roncesville area in Toronto. And so they started fishing out of Grenadier Pond and then started going up to Barry's Bay, which is the first Polish settlement area. So my dad and my uncle, they're Polish. Okay. okay? <laughs> so I got that Polish heritage area where we go up and fish. That's my cottage. And like the place where we went up to the cottage and where they mentored me and taught me how to fish and like would take us on epic fishing adventures all the time throw the two canoes or three canoes in a pickup truck and go to a different lake and like it was like me my dad my uncle my brother my cousin and we would all just get in the canoes and go have fun fishing the whole day come back fillet the fish we kept quite a bit of fish when we were younger and that was kind of like my dad's or grandfather's way of fishing is you're not a good angler unless you catch a string or a fish like your (laughs) limit a big fish right and that kind of changed along the years even even they changed their ways of not keeping so many but that mentor my uncle george he's passed away now now, he was a huge influence on me and one of the biggest reasons was not just because he took us out fishing with my dad but around the campfires at the cottage one of my favorite places to be because my uncle had a great knack for storytelling okay <laughs> and this was like the best because all his stories were to do with fishing <laughs> so whether it was that day we went on a fishing trip or like a trip when he was 16 with you know my dad or one of his other fishing buddies he would tell the best fish stories ever would just <laughs> I was always so captivated by them. You know, I'd sit by the campfire and just listen to Uncle George's fish stories and he'd be so into it. And he would even be making sounds of when the fish hit and we'd be like, Psh! <laughs> like grabbing the lure and then like he made it real like i was there with him right and it was just uh, yeah you have people that could just put you telling. right in that story. Yeah. yeah and so he had that okay my dad didn't really have that too much right <laughs> but my dad was a really good angler yeah and so was my uncle george so i got to learn both and like he was one of my biggest mentors and even when he passed on like i still felt his positive energy and his soul really like talking to me and like being when i go out fishing okay i'm so obsessed with fishing especially when i was younger i when i go fishing i'd be like cast 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 i wouldn't touch my sandwich that i brought or my lunch or whatever until i was off the water after like a 12 hour day of fishing okay <laughs> like that's how obsessed i was of fishing so after he passed away i actually started sitting back not taking a cast and just looking around and really taking in nature and all that it has to give and like it was kind of cool because i started my spiritual journey kind of that way too is like i'd feel the wind blow and i'd be like i know instantly like oh that was my uncle saying like i'm here with you i'm having a good time this is amazing that we're here together and it was pretty amazing that that happened in my life to show me that like you know maybe there is something more after you know maybe he's not just up in heaven he's gone and we could be sad forever yeah but it gave me like a happiness when i feel him around and not such a feeling of emptiness and missing him and even now when like people pass away around me with friends and family like i have this way of thinking about it and they stay with me and it really happened 
over like fishing and being out in nature and really like stepping back and like taking a breath in and looking around and being like, life's good. It should be that way. You should enjoy life. You should have fun in life and do what you truly love and what you like. Make it your career like I'm trying to do, you yeah. know, like I'm in a transition right now, but that was the big thing with why I chose to get into this and quit my job and do all this kind of stuff is because I want to live the life that I dream of. And like, I want my kids to inherit what I have created and like be part of it growing up and be around that positive energy that we're trying to give. And it's not any negative stuff around it because I have good intentions about it. I think that's the main thing. Like even when trying to get money from companies to support us, it's hard for me because I'm not in it for the money, but I also have to look at it like it helps grow your company, right? So if I have the right intentions, then I know that that money's going to be going towards the right places and I'll be able to speak to more people, right? So it's one of those things where I don't care about getting rich off this. You know what I mean? Like that's a big part of who I am. And I've always struggled with that internal battle of, you know, oh my gosh, I I can make money and I want to, you know, make money to build my business. But then what are other people thinking? Oh, they're seeing me making money off of teaching kids how to fish. And it's like, oh, they think of me in a certain way, but I can't think of it that way because ultimately I know in my heart, my intentions are righteous and they're for the right reasons of actually creating a better world and creating young kids who are going to walk the walk that I try to teach them and like respect our environment, respect others and be good people, be, you know, honest with themselves. And I got to say, like, we hear a lot of like stories about role models, but really it sounds like your role models that you've mentioned really did have a direct impact on you starting this business. Like, it sounds like your uncle was a big part of this, especially after, unfortunately, that he passed on. But I mean, it sounds like something great came of it, sorry. Like, no, ab- absolutely. And I mean, we, we're all here for a short period of time. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, the faster we face it, maybe the faster we can kind of give our own butts a kick you exactly. know, and get our <laughs> lives together the way we want it. Or do you just settle and then, you know your life's done and you're like what the hell did I do with my life I look at my life and I'm like at the end of it it's not about my name or my company it's what kind of impact have I created yes. to spread like that trickle effect and like making a positive impact while I'm here and doing something fun and something new and something kind of different and even even with that like you're you're helping teach people whether it be being a better person or enjoying all those moments like you talk about you and your dad your cousin your uncle and i mean really what i gather from it is like you guys had a bunch of memorable moments that a lot of families today aren't having because i mean everyone's caught up in work everyone's caught up in paying the bills which i mean you got to do everyone's yeah. caught up in all these things that don't matter social media home entertainment when you could do something as simple as going outside in nature whether it be fishing or not but spending those times together have a little campfire yeah, it's, it's quality yeah. time right tell stories exactly. stuff yeah. that's gonna last and you're gonna think back like oh i remember that time when so-and-so was talking about this and those are the things that keep people's memory alive right yeah yeah when your phone's out of your hand yeah yeah, and it's so hard. Like, I can even admit, like, I'm addicted to my phone. Okay? Me too. I can admit that. Mind you, when I'm on the water fishing, my wife texts me and she's like, why aren't you replying? <laughs> yeah. Like, when I'm out in nature, the only thing I use it for is photos. And I don't, I'm not crazy about photos. Like, I'm not going to stop in a moment to wait and wait and wait for that photo. Like, yeah. you capture it or you don't. I like to take photos too. But ultimately, I want to be in the moment more than anything. And that's one place is out in nature, whether I'm fishing or going on a hike with my kids, is one place where I totally am not addicted to my phone. Yeah. When I'm in all of the other, you know, scenarios, I'm like on my phone looking at, looking at. But even that quality time we talk, about is like I find being at home and you're watching a movie yeah you're together with your family but you're focused on the screen and the screen is entertainment it's great we all kind of love it but at the same time is a lot of us abuse it whether it's the phone the tablets the computers or the TV is we abuse it and we spend way too much time on there right yeah. it's easy to it's oh, too yeah. easy to right you don't usually get anything out of that time right like it's not like kill time <laughs> yeah you're, you're killing time like you're never gonna think back like Oh, yeah, I remember that movie I watched that one time with my dad. Like, that was a great movie, right? You're going to think of the moments like we yeah, were talking there's, about. There's some that touch you, right? But ultimately, yeah, it's it's entertainment. It's, yeah. it's entertainment. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is our last commercial break. If you made it this far, thank you, and I have to assume you found this interesting. To keep up to date with new episodes, be sure to follow or subscribe to us on your preferred listening channel. We are available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts, in addition to Facebook and YouTube. 
And of course, you can find all of our shows and more on our website, DufferinSpotlight.ca. If we are not already on your preferred platform, be sure to let us know through our website and we will do our best to get on it. We prioritize accessibility to our shows, so we will do our best to make it happen. That's it for commercials, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Dufferin Spotlight on business. When you were younger, did you think you'd be doing this? You know what? Not a chance. Didn't yeah. think I was doing I thought I was going to be in the NHL until I was like 15. <laughs> and then I realized, wait, wait, wait. I'm only playing like double-A hockey. Nobody's looking at me. Like, okay, yeah, it's not going to work. My high school hockey was awesome. I loved it. But yeah, no. It was weird. It was almost like I had my blinders on or something and didn't realize like the way to make it is being the best of the best leagues. Yeah. And I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> we know. Well, I had a lot of fun though, right? Like, but that's what I always envisioned myself doing: is playing hockey, playing hockey, playing hockey. I was so obsessed with that too. But then life changes and grow up and you meet girls, <laughs> and uh, then you meet the right one and you start a family. And then it was a couple years before we actually got married that my wife and I like started fishing frenzy and the vision for it. So it was totally kind of unplanned. I got a call from my cousin actually where it started, and my cousin said this is what i'm doing now in my life so he actually played professional hockey and when he retired he hooked up with a guy who did like baseball fan fests and stuff and yeah. had a traveling fan fest exhibit with like wiffle balls and all that kind of stuff home run derbies how fast is your pitch and you go to different events and set up so he's like i'm working with him on a hockey one and they did a like a hockey traveling exhibit where they did the like world juniors in ottawa one year and set up kind of like a hockey hall of fame exhibit where you're shooting saving pucks and all that kind of stuff he called me and was like this is what i'm doing we're doing this like traveling the interactive exhibit stuff like do you have anything like with fishing because i know you love fishing right and uh, i was like i'm kind of working on something it's more for like magazine paper kind of stuff but like i think it could translate pretty well and literally me and my wife went into like think tank mode and like <laughs> brainstorming mode and went down to the states to pitch them the idea and they love like a lot of what we were saying so they basically said let's go let's go do this awesome and so what we did was we went down to a trade show all for fairs and expos in the states and we went to vegas for the show and we pitched our idea to a couple fairs and festivals and we got two fairs illinois state fair and georgia national fair to buy into our idea we didn't build one dock we did not have one fishing <laughs> rod other than my own personal collection at this point and they bought into our idea of this exhibit that we wanted to create wow they didn't know we didn't create it like you know what i mean it was a we pitched it yeah and then we created the exhibit for those shows and ran the shows down in the states for two years we did five different shows and to me and my wife and my cousin it was like a big success because we realized what we created and we brought it to life like our idea to life and we saw how much it was impacting people and how many people have never fished before and how yeah. come there's no programs that were in fishing and stuff like that for kids and we also realized a negative thing that the guy who did the baseball stuff didn't come to one of our shows didn't pay his staff properly didn't care about people like he was just in it for the money and he was like yeah one of those guys right like he literally was like hey check out my new coca-cola machine in my house <laughs> yet three of his staff members were like four weeks behind pay and they're like looking at him like what is wrong with this picture like it's so wrong right so wrong yeah and i mean this was almost like 15 years ago right so it was one of those things so we ended up just walking away from him we got married and then we were like well this is our idea this is our baby he yeah. did, he's not doing anything with it i don't know if he sold the material the pond that we had and all that kind of stuff or had a bonfire with it. i have no idea <laughs> definitely died when we left because he doesn't know anything about fishing didn't care about it yeah, yeah um, definitely anything. wouldn't have had the passion yeah right so it, right? we were like exactly. well why don't we just go home and start it up but we got married and then the year after we were pregnant and we, we got the cne for the first year <laughs> and the western and the western fair in london Jeez. the first year we had those two shows and so we did kind of the same thing right like we sold the idea mind you we had pictures from the old shows in the states to showcase but yeah. we wanted to build it differently too because we were literally using an above ground pool for our live fish pond in the states and you put that thing together it took like five people in like six to eight hours right and when you put it together once or twice it doesn't go together as well as it should or is supposed to <laughs> i don't think they're, they're meant the, to. so so yeah so when we rebuilt the show or re like designed the show pretty much we designed it in that mind frame of how can we easily pack up and tear down and set back up and so my wife sourced this awesome pond that they use for fighting forest fires oh nice and it's a fold out pond it's literally three feet high and 15 feet by 15 feet but when you fold it up it's only like a foot 
wide by three and 15. So it's like a ladder. Yeah. And it has this tarp inside. So we bought that and we've been running our like live fish pond out of that. Nice. And it's pretty cool because you get the filter system. And when we get live fish, I, I, I want to mention this because it's not super important to the listeners out there, but the way we do it, I'm very proud of that. When we get live fish from fish farms, we put them in our pond. It's same as an aquarium. We got to have our pond running for like a day or two before we dechlorinize the water because most of it's like very chlorinated water. Yep. Um, water. So yeah, so we want to make sure that's a healthy environment for the fish to come in. And then we're just catch and release for all the kids there. No barbs on the hooks. No one's casting. They're just dipping their rod in. But one of the main things that I love about what we do and we talk about ethical angling and stuff like that is after every show, we find a home for them. So right now we're working with a fish farm that actually drops the fish off. After the shows are done, they come and take the fish back. Oh, nice. And they keep them alive. And it's not just, you know, have a, a big barbecue or fish fry after, right? Like, yeah. I want to treat the fish the best we can while we have them there. And it's like one of those things where like, we want to show the kids how to fish, ethical angling, bring fishing to them. We want to treat the fish right and keep them healthy while we have them. But we also look at it like the bigger picture is if we're, you know, teaching the kids how to fish and, but the bigger picture is we're teaching these kids to be conservationists and they're going to protect more fish. And I've had conversations with some people who come with our like activists that actually have a conscious and understand and want to learn what's going on. They don't agree with it at the time. But when we have this conversation, they understand that it's like for the greater good and like yeah. that we're, we're saving so many more animals, fish and our land and our natural resources from having these fish in our pond. And they don't even realize that we're actually keeping almost all of them alive and sending them back to a place, right? They, yeah. they like some of the actors come in and just call, you know, fish killers, this, that, right? Like just, yeah. it's a big divide, right? I mean, that's, that's a big thing though like you're saying too like it's better in that situation with someone who has the knowledge because i mean as an angler myself i mean you see all the time that whether it be not taking the time to learn or they're excited and they jump into it and they don't have someone to show them but a lot of people don't know how to properly handle a fish yep. yeah and when you're doing that all the time especially when you get that big trophy fish and you get your picture and you see how they're handling it and then how they release it i mean it's a sad thing when you're like yeah that fish isn't going to make it after that well and even like i had uh one story is I was at the cottage with my three young cousins. They were probably like six, eight, and 10. And we went to the bridge. I caught a big smallmouth bass. There's a little bit of flow to the water there. So I didn't really know if I had a fish on or not. So I waited a little bit extra than I should have. And when I set the hook, caught this nice big four and a half pound smallmouth. It was 4.4. So it wasn't four and a half, but 4.4 smallmouth. Nice big smallmouth bass. And the hook was in its throat. So I didn't have pliers on me at the bridge. I don't know why, but I usually have. That's one of my tools I always have but I have needle nose pliers to get hooks out yeah. if they're whatever. So I had to run it back to my cottage, which was literally like three cottages over from this bridge, right? So it wasn't a far run, but get it back in the water, get the pliers, unhook the hook and it's bleeding a little. I'm trying to revive it and I'm trying and trying and trying. And my cousins are watching me. I don't want to keep this fish because I don't want to harvest a four and a half pound smallmouth. That's a great breeding fish that's going to have a lot of eggs when they reproduce. Yeah. So I didn't want to take that from my lake, but I couldn't revive it. I hooked it in its throat. So ethical angling is... Is I'm gonna harvest it and we're gonna eat it and I'm gonna honor that animal yeah. you know what I mean and like that's one of the things too that I take and I try to really implement to my programs and to the people who are mentors with me not just the kids but our instructors is the old teachings of the natives and the indigenous people about respecting the animals when they harvest them and like that is really dear to my heart like I try to keep those teachings alive through our programs to honor the animals if you're gonna harvest it like honor that animal. that's a life right yeah and to be conscious about not over harvesting you know what i mean and like it wasn't our natives that killed all the buffalo you know what i mean like it's things like that we really got to think about and be conscious about because we as stewards as conservationists need to be learning always because the ways i preach about today might change and i'm one to admit that i want to learn i want to grow yeah and I'm, i don't want to be stubborn in my ways you know what i mean 100%. and i don't want to have that way of thinking that's so blindsided by a better way yeah you know so that's kind of like i want to evolve i don't want to and that's, get stuck that's a great mindset to have because i mean not always going into every situation thinking that you know everything or even if you do have a lot of knowledge but being able to take what someone says and be like you know what actually i might be able to alter what i'm doing to help save you know something else so yeah. I, mean, I mean that's a great way to go in about this anyway because i mean even with all the knowledge that we see that you have at least 
you're always looking to learn more. So exactly. Yeah. Well, even just to touch on too is like, so I have a certain amount of knowledge, I'm growing all that kind of stuff, but I really like working with organizations or people who have the knowledge that I don't. Yeah. So whether it's our ambassadors, there's some young old ambassadors that have like really good knowledge about river fishing, uh, float fishing in the rivers for steelhead trout, um, rainbows, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And we also work with groups like Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, and they have brought their invasive species unit. It's like two tables of education about invasive species to our exhibit when we're at the c &E usually. Cool. And so we utilize their expertise in that field to educate people, right? Because that's the thing is I don't have all the knowledge. I will never claim to have all the knowledge, yeah. right? Like that's just, that's me. I don't, I try to stay humbled in that way and not feed into my ego. Yeah, yeah, it's dangerous. <laughs> you know, yeah, absolutely. And utilize people who are, you know, doing the same thing. I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but I do want to be creative and have a vision to create new things, right? But there's a lot of things that I can utilize from other groups that are doing amazing things on their own. So yeah, one group that I worked with quite a bit is Toronto Urban Fishing Ambassadors. Oh yeah? And they're just a small group, great ambassadors for our sport. They go to a, a lot of the meetings, their head guys go to a lot of the meetings, whether it's invasive species or Great Lakes, how it's being polluted, how it's being treated and all that kind of stuff to help educate people in the GTA area because there's so many people, such a big population in one little area that is right on one of the best freshwater fisheries in the world, Yeah, Lake Ontario. And it's funny because being from Mississauga and having a cottage up north in this pristine lakes that I fished in, I would come home and in Mississauga, I was right on the Tobacco Creek too and I would never fish it because I always thought it's gross, it's polluted, there's no fish in here, even Lake Ontario. I always had that, that mentality, right, about that fishery. And then as I started doing this and meeting the guys from Toronto Urban Fishing Ambassador and realizing like we have an amazing fishery right here that most people thought the same way I used to is they see some garbage or a lot of garbage anyway, like in the water floating and they think it's polluted and that there's no fish to eat there or no fish that even live there. Meanwhile, it's a really healthy fishery. So if you follow the right groups like the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. So okay. they do a lot of studies, rehabilitation of the waterfront. They actually have a huge project all along Lakeshore from like the east end of Toronto to the west end of Toronto. I think even into Mississauga, like down to Port Credit, where they're rehabilitating the shoreline for different species of fish, animals, pathways for people to enjoy, and even fishing nodes so people can fish safely and not hook someone who's on a skateboard or a bike behind them, right? <laughs> yeah, so probably like, a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so but they also do a lot of studies within that watershed to see how healthy these fish actually are for us. And so they even have signs posted about like what you can harvest and what you should be eating from children to pregnant women to adults. Wow. So yeah. That's useful. Yeah, so so great work. Like, there's a lot of great organizations out there doing good work. I mean, MNR Ministry of Natural Resources. They do a lot of great stuff. They stocked Toronto area, the harbor, I think, with like a couple hundred thousand or whatever the number is. But walleye. Yeah. So stocked it with a whole bunch of walleye, and that's starting to reproduce and become a great walleye fishery. You know. Nice. So, that's. I think a lot of people don't realize that as well is that all the people that are going out there and they're buying fishing licenses hunting licenses tags all that money is supposed to be going back into to help maintain and conserve like our fisheries and wildlife habitats right so i mean it's not all bad even in that aspect because that's a lot of money brought in every year to go into trying to help and save things that might be endangered right now yep oh absolutely well there's a stat out there anglers and hunters are the biggest group together that makes an impact with their efforts in conservation than any other group in the world is anglers and hunters and you look at some of the stuff on the internet and you see some activists and the hunters and how separate they are right and how the activists look at hunters and anglers as being like murderers and killers and i mean there are some anglers and hunters that poach litter and are destructive and they're not like, ethical <laughs> yeah i'm against them too yep that's horrible. You shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff, right? And then also a lot of hunters and anglers look at like all vegans as being these horrible activists. And it's like, sorry, that's not the case either. Yeah, cause because you'll have people on the left or not, I don't want to put them on matters of left and right, but, you'll but yeah, people... it's a good way to kind of visualize it for people, right? Yeah, and you'll have examples of them making things up 
And it's like, okay, just because a few people do the wrong things on both sides doesn't mean that's representative of everybody. Yeah. There is legitimate concerns to have with the environment. And there's the hunters and the anglers do a lot of good. They put a lot of money into the environment and they give the resources for everyone to actually do the great things there is. Like if we didn't have the MNR and all the fees that they collect through licenses and all, yeah, all the tags like like rob was saying we wouldn't be able to do the like the waterfront restoration i think a lot of that goes back to, to like i mean you think about social media and most of the stuff you're seeing is the extreme stuff that's what people are watching that's what people hear about you that's what the news stories yeah, are right they want ratings yeah. they don't care about you don't hear about yeah. the, the the normal things going on in your average person you hear about all the extreme stuff so stuff from that'll never affect both you, sides either. right i mean yeah most absolutely. people and, well <laughs> even for like instance that. like i have i've friends that are vegans but they don't push their views on things oh, we have great conversations i actually don't eat that much meat like yep. at all like truthfully i don't i change my lifestyle to affect how i care about the environment these two groups of anglers hunters and vegans and they're closer than many people think but there is oh, such yeah. a line drawn as if we're against each other and i think that's total bs because we both care so much we're doing things in our life to protect the environment once most people yeah. sit down and talk and long as you know you're a decent person you could see each other's point of view you could see each other's sides you might not fully agree with each other but you'll be like Absolutely. okay you know what I fully get your point of view and they'll be like, you know what? I understand what you're doing, what you're yep. doing too. You're it's, not a bad person. Yeah, and like All right, that seems like a great place to end for this episode. We will release part two of this on Thursday. Thank you for listening to Dufferin Spotlight on Business and I hope you enjoyed it. Big thank you to Mike for taking the time to help us out with our show and to those of you who listened. The best way to get in touch with Fishing Frenzy is to go through their website or check out their Facebook or Instagram page. The easiest way to keep up with their show is to follow or subscribe wherever you prefer to listen. We are currently available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Apple Podcasts, in addition to Facebook and YouTube. Of course, you can find all of our episodes and more on our website, dufferinspotlight.ca. If there's anywhere else you'd like to see us, please let us know through our website, and we'll do our best to get on it. If you haven't had a chance to check out our last episode, it was with Paul Hensberger of Let Me Out Escape Rooms. That's right, we have an escape room in Dufferin. Check out the episode to find out more. It's a good one, so I hope you enjoy listening. Until next time, get to know your community and shop local. Yeah.